Hello, everyone. I am Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. Perpetual Chess is a weekly chess interview show where we talk with accomplished chess players, authors, and personalities about their lives, their careers, and how to improve at chess. Perpetual Chess is brought to you through the generosity of its Patreon and PayPal supporters and by Chessable.com. Hey everyone, welcome back to Perpetual Chess. We have another high-level chess trainer joining us this week. He also is the 2010 champion of Armenia. He coached the national team of Thailand. He has coached many title players, including the recent guest on Perpetual Chess, Grandmaster Kevin Go, uh, young Indian hotshot, uh, Grandmaster Pritu Gupta, and he is the founder of the educational chess site, chessmood.com, which has tons of great opening videos and middle game videos and classic game videos as we'll be talking about. But without further ado, let's bring him in. Grandmaster Avtek Gregorian joining us from Armenia. How are you? Hey, Ben. Hello all to all the listeners. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me here. And also thank you for all the value you are bringing here with your uh, podcast. It's, it's great. I'm doing great. And you? Uh, I'm pretty good, yeah. Um, as as we were just talking about, it's never a dull moment here in my house. But um, but everything's good. We're healthy and happy, so really nothing else matters. Yeah. Um, and happy and happy to be talking to you. Same, um, same. So you're back in Armenia. You're you're putting out tons of content on your website. I'm pro- I'm guessing I might be your newest member since I just took the plunge and signed up for Chess Mood uh, two days ago. Um, I had checked out a couple of videos in the past because I know like when COVID hit, you did a thing where you unlocked your videos for free for a while, which was a nice gesture. And I've been, I've enjoyed your content in the past, but now I'm on board. There's a few opening holes I'm I'm hoping to plug. Um, but Avtek, why don't you start by telling us what your day-to-day is like running a sort of chess startup as you are with chessmood.com? Okay, it's, um, it's running a startup, especially when you do it without investment, but you run it bootstrap, so all, all, everything you cover on your own. It's much harder than most people may think. And uh, people see just this, uh, the websites they go, they see the courses, they see some streams and other stuff, but they cannot imagine how much work is behind the sense. And uh, how my day is going, it's absolutely crazy. <laughs> so it's usually it starts around 7 a.m. and it works with, uh, t- I work till 9 around 9, sometimes even 10. Uh, it's six around six days a week. So it's, it's going, going very crazy to do all this stuff. Uh, to launch new courses, to, to make the streams, to have one one call with our all our new pro members, and hopefully we will have two soon. Uh-huh. <laughs> one one call uh, to read article for every week. So this is taking lots of time. Um, yeah, I'm also lucky that uh, my wife, my little girl, is also with me, and uh, she's helping me with the same way. She's working. Uh, she's uh, waking up uh, with me, working with me till very late. But um, uh, myself. Um, I, I knew that this is what I will face when I started this. I knew that it's going to be not easy, and I was ready for that. So uh, that's why uh, all, all is good, yeah? I don't yeah. get anything. Uh, I have, I'm have in good mood. Uh, I intentionally went here, and I knew what was uh, ex- expecting me, and so I'm here. So days are going crazy, but mm, the value we are managing to bring to the chess world the feedbacks we are getting the success stories we are having uh, this is all compensating more than compensating all the hard work wow yeah and you've got what like six grandmasters helping you out with the website uh yeah six uh soon soon they are going uh, to be more uh there are people with whom we are working not officially but uh most probably soon uh, they will join the team officially too Wow, that's intense. Um, and what was the vision when you launched this site? I mean, obviously, you're a super strong player. You're over 2,600. Um, I know you haven't been playing as much, put more of an emphasis on training. But why specifically Chess Mood? Uh, well, uh, two things happened to, uh, why I decided to launch this uh, Chess Mood. First, when I was uh, the coach of the talent the national team, at that time I started to uh, work more, uh, to work, to speak more with amateurs. And then I saw a real problem there. People were buying different kind of courses, uh, but still they were struggling to improve. 
uh, because most of the courses were done not with really high quality or uh, say it was different courses and watch this course and uh, after you watch this course you will become a grand master marketing like this yeah and these people were watching and still not getting the result and they was frustrated. They were putting some amount of time, hard work, but not getting it. And uh, their mood was not good. Another thing happened uh, to, to me uh, that I decided, okay, I will launch this chess mode was I got an offer from a different websites uh, to uh, record a video for them. But they offered such a ridiculous uh, price. And when I said, how is it possible to make quality content with this uh, price? They said, you don't worry really about quality. What we do, uh, you just make the course. Uh, it's all about marketing. People market. You don't worry about that. And then I thought, OK, if these guys are really selling so much, so many people are buying this stuff, and this is, the quality, this is their quality standard. Okay, there should be something else in the in the market. And then I saw, okay, there are some uh, good um, websites, uh, but still many, many, many things are missing for really helping people to get their goals, to really improve. In the market, most of the things are this. Um, they research, they, have, they, they hire people, uh, researchers. Researchers make the research. This is what chess players want. And they create, okay, this is what they want. They create something like that. They market it and sell it. But the real question is what they need. And here things become tricky. So these two things, when I saw uh, how much people are struggling and I saw uh, how low quality people, uh, courses uh, they are, I'm not speaking about all of the courses. Of course, there are super high quality courses. Uh, uh, yeah, but uh, also there are uh, very low quality courses which are made uh, with just one purpose, to generate money, not to help uh, chess lovers. Our mission was totally different. We were not... Uh, uh, speaking about any money, all was about how to help our people. And all the plan was uh, was there uh, what we can do most to help our students to grow fast. And I believe this is, uh, this is the secret to why our students are uh, raising their students so fast. Yeah, that's that's nice to hear. I, I know what you mean about some of the some of the offerings available. I mean, there, as you say, there's also a lot of uh, there's also good stuff out there. But chess players like myself have have an insatiable uh, desire to get better and yours at, at like $30 a month right now that's at a price point that's affordable for for a lot of people um, so Avtech, when you're working with players I mean I know you personally work with a lot of titled players but with the community the chess mood community is there one issue that you see in the players more than others in terms of obstacles to improving um Okay, uh, one of the things that I am um, noticing during this one-on-one -on -one call is uh, people have very um, high goals. Like many people have around uh, 1,800, but they want to become grandmasters. But one of the biggest problems is uh, that they are not under really understanding uh, the hard work they, are, they need to do. Because just dreaming and uh, really going for that are very different. And we have in chess mode different kind of students, people uh, who themselves, they say they just fun, they are just fans, and they are going to just enjoy the chess. They don't really want to improve. We have people who say they want to get there and they are putting super hard and really good work, and people who say, but not really do for now. My biggest challenge is with uh, group two. Uh, sorry, with, with the last group who say they want uh, something uh, high, but don't do. So it's uh, my task to motivate our students, but also it's my task to open their eyes. Uh, uh, there are lots of uh, articles written about becoming grandmasters, and most of them are uh, the point that, oh, it's easy. You just work to this, 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 and you become grandmasters because it's cool to motivate people. But to tell the hard uh, parts, and they motivate people. It's not easy to do. And why to do? Yeah, if if you could just motivate them, people will say, "Oh, thank you, thank you, good, good." So when I uh, publish the article, is it become uh, is it easy to become a grandmaster? Many people were demotivated, but many people were not. They said, "Okay, this is the truth." Yeah, and they they need to do. Uh, they need to decide. They go there. They go for it, or they they don't. So one of the biggest problem is this, and the second was. Um, they were frustrated a lot before coming to Chessmode because they were entering to different websites, buying this course, this course, this course, this course, and then they were not getting anywhere. 
uh, there was not structurized material and they uh, at first start, started to learn D4, then went to E4, then went to D4. There was someone, um, 1900 uh, player, uh, who represented him as a famous coach and he told him, do 12 hours tactics and all will be good, you will become grandmasters. They did it, they didn't work. So this frustration is the biggest problem. Uh, they come with already frustrated to try to uh, do different things. And some kind of, they really don't have that trust that they will do this and it will work. But all the people that are really keeping the study plan, after a few months, they are saying, okay, this is this, this is it. I, I, I'm coming there. So yeah, Optech, it's a good point you raise. I don't know where these students are coming from because I hope that most people, I mean, it's one thing if you're already a titled player or if you're a young player on an um, upward trajectory, but I hope for adults that, that they appreciate just how difficult it is to become a grandmaster. Um, I think uh, it's very noble to pursue continued improvement in chess and it's something, it's, it's a worthwhile goal, but I always encourage people to try to, take it one step at a time. Like here in the US, you have the class system based on uh, 200 point rating increments where there's like um, class A would be 1800 to 2000, class B 1600 to 1800, then there's expert, then there's master. And rather than just be like, I'm gonna make it to FM if you're rated 1600 or something like that, if you're an adult, um, that might be doable with a lifetime of work, but it's, I th it's better to have uh, smaller goals along the way. Um, so yeah, it's, I understand it because it's when, when chess sweeps you up, it's such a fun game and you want to envelop yourself in it and you want to have the results that, that you, I mean, you want to have great results come along with it, but, um, doing this show every weekend, just for me, trying to even attain a level I had, um, when I was most active, it, you just learn to appreciate just what a challenge it is to, to improve. Yeah, Ben, what you mentioned, it's uh, it's a very crucial thing, and I absolutely agree with you that uh, the easiest and fastest way to uh, get your goal is to put a very uh, hard and uh, not easy achievable goal and then divide it to milestones. And then milestone by, by milestone you go. Uh, the biggest uh, thing uh, why people think that, okay, they will become Grandmaster uh, very fast is this. It's uh, comparably easier to get from zero to uh, 1,500. Yeah. It's much easier to get there than from 22 to 2,300. That 100 points can be tougher than to get from zero to 1,500. And then when they are raising, okay, in one year, they just started to play chess. In one year, they got 1,500. I said, oh, in a few words, of course, I will get 25. Right. This, is, this is the biggest frustrations. Yeah, it just gets harder and harder. As your friend and student, uh, Kevin Go talked about when we interviewed him recently, him talking about just how hard it gets as you ap approach something like the Grandmaster title. So anyone who has not heard that interview um, from about six weeks ago, I encourage them to go uh, check that out. Could you tell us a little bit about your your perspective? He gave you a lot of credit. He was very um, very appreciative of of the help that you gave him. But what was it like for you working with Kevin Go? Uh, well, um, one of the best part of uh, uh, of starting this chess mode is the people whom I met. In uh, after after launching this chess mode, I met so many cool people from different part of the world. From Asia to uh, Canada to Africa, everywhere. M most probably, uh, we have not any member from Antarctica, but from the rest of the world, we have people, and uh, we have very cool people. And I'm very, I appreciate it very much. The people I'm meeting, and Kevin was one of the guys uh, with whom he we started to work. At first, I was his coach and student, and he was my student. But soon we became very close friends, and uh, Kevin is. Um, great example in the not in the, just in the chess world but in the world that something that it seems not achievable uh, with correct and hard work it can be done uh, Kevin is the uh, CFO of, of a very big startup he had kids uh, he had family he had parents who whom he, uh, he, to, to, he took care of, and he wanted at the same time to become grandmaster but he realized that it should it, it's going to be not easy and there should be put in put on a work and he did this work i was uh, yeah uh, i appreciate how much credit he gives but always i say it's to such students like him or other grandmasters who made it i always tell him i am i was just there to help them but the rest they did it was inside very rough of themselves 
the inside barrier when you are coming very tired after work to home. Uh, but uh, you just take the dinner that your wife prepared for you, you kiss your daughter, and then you go and you open your chessboard. It's the inside warrior who is pushing you there. Uh, so Kevin is a fantastic example uh, that uh, the things are possible to do. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy to meet, uh, to, to, to meet Kevin. He's a great person. Yeah, it was an inspiring interview. Yeah, and he didn't even get into like, uh, you know, the caring for his family um, and having a kid like he didn't even touch on that. And it already was sounded super impressive, just given his professional life and continuing to pursue it. And I have to say, I mean, uh, I I'm trying to get better at chess right now, but I struggle with the issues you mentioned, too. It's like I can for me, the biggest challenge is doing the hard stuff like it's a, often I'll feel like, OK, I can review some openings um, that that will help me remember things. I don't mind working on some basic tactics. But for me to sit down, uh, you know, after a long day dealing with professional and family responsibilities and actually work on calculation or something like that, um, God forbid, blindfold puzzles or end game studies um, is it's often I end up putting it off. And I think that's what I need most. So what, what do you tell your students who struggle with motivation? Uh, well, uh, r r right, Ben, uh, one of the questions that people ask, uh, is it possible uh, to for someone who is 40 years old and he is a mature to become a grandmaster? Is it late or not? Uh, so, so there is nothing to do that uh, like 10 years old kid uh, mind is working faster than someone for, who is 40 years. The only question that uh, the only challenge as someone who is 40 years old is that he has less, less time because he has more responsibilities, he has family, this, this. 10, ten years old kid uh, doesn't need to take care, okay, what uh, should I, uh, how should I make money and to take care of this stuff? So he has, he can spend 15 hours a day on chess. <laughs> when uh, you are going, uh, you are becoming older, more responsibilities are coming. So less time you can invest in uh, your dream. This is the biggest challenge. So that's that challenge everyone has. And about motivation, um, my philosophy is always, okay, it's not mine. Yeah, I, I learned from others, but I believe in this, uh, that everything should start uh, from answering the question why. Whatever we do in our life. It can be becoming a great master. It can be um, uh, promoting a job. It can be starting a startup. Or even me, when I started this chess mode, yeah, it should be strong why. If your why is uh, is weak, uh, you it's, it's very tough to go to go ahead. Because when you want to do something great in your life, in your career, you will get lots of uh, punches to your mouth. And if your why is weak, it's very tough going to be to uh, stand on your legs again. But if you're why strong, no matter what is happening, you are tired, uh, you, there are problems, this, this, this. No, your, if your why is strong, you are just pushing there and getting. Uh, one of the things that I'm doing uh, in my coaching career, uh, I'm not accepting uh, everyone, as many coaches do. I, I choose whom, whom I work, and I should believe in students' goal. So uh, Kevin was one of the guys whom I absolutely believe. He had a very strong guy. I'm not sure if he mentioned that or not, but he had very strong why, why he wanted to become a grandmaster. Uh, and I believed in his why, and his why was one of his reasons why he could come back at home very tired, but still work at chess and ma make it happen. So why, I believe why is a very important thing. I'm not sure which reason. I know he was annoyed he didn't get to the Olympiad team. <laughs> and I know that uh, Singapore doesn't have a lot of grandmasters, but well, was it, was it one of those reasons or was it something else? Oh, it was something else and it's a little bit sad topic. Uh, ah, yeah, I know what you refer to. Okay. Yeah, so it, it, um, it, it, it was related to his, to his dad. Yes, right. Um, okay, um, so why don't you tell listeners a little bit more about uh, both what's available now on Chess Mood and I know you're, you're, you're adding new material all the time and what the vision is in terms of um, how the material is presented and how you think you can help players. When uh, I stopped playing professional chess, I was not just uh, coaching, I was also learning lots of different things. And especially during the period when I launched the Chess Mood, I understood that uh, just being a good chess player is not enough for running a company. And I need to learn lots of different skills for running a company. And uh, most of the things I started to, to learn, uh, they were online. But one thing I was struggling, and then I, when I asked my friends, they were struggling in it too. Uh, 
And, uh, there was two main uh, problems. One was uh, I couldn't find structurized uh, material. So I watched Discord and that, and that, and that. I was entering some websites. There was coming up uh, 100 courses, and I didn't know from where to start and where to finish. Uh, the second problem was I could uh, watch the course, but I didn't see it in practice. I had just theoretical knowledge. And the third, if I wanted to ask someone a question, there was no one. So the chess mode, uh, we created, it covered all three parts, theoretical, practical, and then if someone wants to ask a question. So uh, we uh, designed and published uh, lots of courses is more than 100 hours, step-by-step -step openings for white and black. And this is the theoretical part of their knowledge. So people see it as uh, they have that theoretical strong knowledge, but then as they see it in practice, uh, we play uh, streams, we have webinars, and during the streams, uh, we play only the openings we teach in the courses. So they can see their knowledge in, in the practice. And this is a very essential uh, uh, part of education. If you don't see the practical part, it's, it's going to be very weak at theoretical knowledge. And at the end, whenever people are watching courses and uh, they have a question, they can ask in the forum and uh, get uh, right, uh, right uh, away uh, answers from grandmasters, not from someone else. These are the three parts, uh, three essential parts of choice mode, why we are different and why I believe uh, our, our students are doing so good. It's not just courses, yeah, it's all three parts together. And uh, about uh, what courses we are uh, now uh, working at, now we are launching many middle game and end game courses. Mostly we covered all the opening part. It's going step by step for white, step by step for black. It's covered very deeply. Now uh, we are adding more material on middle game and end game. So there are going to be a few uh, different sections. Uh, going to be one section where it's we are covering their must know theoretical end games. Not absolutely all the theoretical end games because it's such a boring and big big job. <laughs> Just must know, which are really must. Yeah, um, and then it's gonna be practical end games, and there are already few pieces. So you see the technique, uh, how you are going to uh, win uh, equal positions, how Ulf Anderson, Smyslov, or Rubinstein were doing, and then it's gonna be middle game, all the possible topics, attacking to bishops, weak pawn, breakthrough, defense, absolutely anything. It's a, it's a, it's a super, super big work. But uh, this work I have started uh, last year, and I could easily already launch 10 courses. Hmm. Uh, but I want to keep the quality standard, and all the new coaches who are coming and uh, joining the chess mode, uh, they are surprising why you are not launching. And I'm saying, no, the material is not enough. Uh, we need more research. Uh, the quality standard is higher than you think, so we should we should do more research. And most of the time, how we are doing, um, for example, if in the course there should be uh, 20 examples, uh, in our database we should have minimum 200. So only 10%, only the best 10% is going to the course. Not just, okay, we have 20 examples, let's put it, all of them, okay, it's ready. So this is the way I know many people are uh, writing books about some calculations. They have 200 examples of calculation. Okay, let's write a book about calculation. Now we are we have this 10% uh, rule. So only best 10% is going uh, to the courses. The same, we have that course, 100 must know classical games. Uh, we had more than 1,000 collected games. In, initially, it was around 10,000, but then we reduced it to 1,000, and then from that 1,000, we, cho we chose uh, the 100. So this is uh, the quality we are trying to keep. And yeah, this is the courses we are going to, uh, to add more, end game and middle game. Cool. Yeah, I checked out a couple of the classical game videos and enjoyed them. And I was curious with the opening videos, um, because I don't think we're revealing too many secrets by naming a couple of the openings you you currently have courses on. It's like the Benko Gambit, uh, the Accelerated Dragon, the Scotch for White. And those are obviously they're, you know, historically accepted and, uh, you know, um, reasonably popular openings, but they're not the most popular. So I was just curious how you came about picking those openings. Yeah, of course, it's, it's not a secret uh, what, we, what we had in our uh, courses uh, and why we chose these courses. It's a very good question. And we spent in real a uh, very, very long time with our grandmaster coaches. And I also brainstorm uh, with the best coaches in the world too. Uh, not what are the best openings for Carlsen or Caruana. 
<laughs> right. But what are the best openings for people uh, between, like, let's say, 1,500 to 2,500, this, this level? Who want uh, just to have opening, not just the best opening. Uh, and then, for example, they learn Petrov. But then when you learn Petrov, you should uh, remember a 50-hour course. And you <laughs> should put uh, your uh, finger on the pulse of the uh, updates because there is a new uh, new game. There is Stockfish 12, which changed change the evaluation of the variation. Okay, and then all the variation is gone. So our mission was not to uh, create a website for 2,700 Grandmasters. Uh, that's why, uh, if okay, if, if it was for 2,700 Grandmasters, uh, for sure the openings gonna would be different. But we decided to put the most practical opening repertoire, uh, which is going to be easy to learn, which are going to be toxic, and at the same time they are going to uh, to speed up the growth of the student. What I mean uh, to to speed up the growth of the student. For example, if you play London system, I believe lots of now our listeners are playing this London system. Oh, yeah. uh, and if you play Open Sicilian, with playing Open Sicilian, you will grow you will grow your chest much faster. This is just one example. It's like uh, you live in one of the villages of Armenia, let's say. Yeah, we have fantastic, beautiful, nice villages. Uh, but if you want to become a millionaire, definitely New York is much better place, <laughs> right? right? So uh, myself, uh, all my life, I was D4 and C4 player. But when we sit it together with our guys, we found that, okay, for sure it should be E4. And then I spent two years for learning E4. From scratch, of course, I got lots of help uh, from my friends because it's, it's, it, it was uh, too, too much job to, to learn from scratch E4, all these openings what to play against e5, what to play c5, c6. Uh, but uh, the process went uh, easy because what I was doing, for example, what we play against Karokan, I was calling all my grandmaster friends uh, who plays Karokan, and I say, what is the most annoying variation against Karokan? Okay. <laughs> exchange variation. Okay, let's go exchange variation. <laughs> is it? Okay. Then e4, e5, hey, GM Sam, what do you think about e4, e5? What is the new trance? said, oh, this coach is becoming very annoying, this, this, this. Uh, he was showing me some lines. I said, okay, this is it. It's aggressive. Or Grand Prix attack. A Grand Prix attack went very funny. Uh, Grand Prix attack has not a good reputation on high level. But we found uh, three, four, four novelties which are changing all the theory of Grand Prix attack. And now uh, during the streams, people are seeing that below 2600 uh, level, uh, like 99% of the games, we are just crushing in the 15 moves uh, because of the way we play the Grand Prix attack. So uh, our openings are not for uh, Corona level people. And not for 2600, like super grandmasters, uh, people who are grandmasters already. They are practical opening repertoire who who are on their way for becoming grandmasters. And uh, with these openings, uh, they are designed the way that uh, they are more than enough for getting grandmaster level. For ju- for, so with just going this, maybe not enough to get 2,700, but for getting the grandmaster level is more than enough. So uh, we didn't want it to, to put some King's Indian Gambit. So if your opponent knows how to, how to play, um, uh, it, you will have trouble when you, uh, when you cross 2,200 level. But uh, we wanted to put something which is tricky, toxic, but at the same time, it's fun- fundamental. It's not like opponent knows, okay, you get problem. Okay. I could I could go down various opening rabbit holes of like specifically what you play, but I've got one more question about chess mood, and then I want to get to your playing career and some book recs and stuff like that. So this is from Patreon supporter of the podcast, Vishnu Srikumar, who's also a friend, an online friend and uh, active adult improver. And Vishnu wrote in to ask you, he says, I had the chance to check out your coverage of the modern Meroxy and the explanations for the first time made me feel like I understood nuances as well as at least some of the title players playing all these lines. The only reason I'm not a chess mood subscriber yet is because of the, the relatively sparse coverage of one D4 openings. Will this change in the near future? Congrats on the high quality material on the website. Okay, got it. So thank you for the questions and all the good words. Uh, about D4, uh, why we choose Bangor? Myself, I was playing all my life, Semislav, Kings Indian, and other openings. Uh, but why we recommended people to play Bangor? It mm-hmm. had a few uh, reasons. Uh, Bangor Gambit, it's uh, it's improving your chess in a way that you are starting to feel 
configurations of your pieces. And also many chess players, when they start to play chess, they, they have fear of sacrificing a pawn. And with uh, playing uh, Banco, you understand the value of active pieces. This is a very, very important skill, which I wanted our students to learn. And also for below uh, 2,400 uh, players, Banco is fantastic, uh, fantastic defense. What we are going to do in the future, we are going to divide our recommended openings for below 2,400 players and for 2,400 plus players. So if someone is 2,400 plus, we have in Trasmut uh, students uh, who are grandmasters. We have even a few secret uh, 2,700 grandmasters. So when they asked me, I said, okay, you don't touch the bank. Oh, these are not for 2,700 level. But for below 24 or below 2,500 level, bank is very fine. And he has not very good reputation. If And if you will get trouble on 2,400 level even, uh, if you don't know a few novelties, which we covered already in the courses. And about D4 also, uh, there are uh, some, uh, we covered already London and the most popular ones. And there are uh, other ones like D4, D5, Knight C3, and Knight F3, the Tory attack. There are a few things that we are going to add, uh, as well as uh, with many advanced sections, adding in the Bank of Gambit, so people on the higher level have better understanding of that. Gotcha, and, yeah. Uh, o- overall, the value of uh, chess mode, yeah, it's that uh, you subscribe it for $29 per month and you don't get access to just bank of course, which in other websites can cost $60 or something, yeah? You get access to all the courses. And not just all the courses, you also ac- get access to, uh, to streams for them, yeah? So just one uh, course, if someone uh, doesn't want to play bank or that's fine. And during the one-on-one calls, I also told our, I also tell our pro members. At first, I give them questions: how much time they have to invest in chess, and what is your goal. And if they don't have very serious goals and they have little time uh, to spend on chess, very often I say skip black opening repertoire, watch this. This is for white, and go to the middle game and the game courses. Okay, yeah, and actually, I should have uh, actually clarified this with Vishnu before asking you, because I'm actually not sure if he means 1d4 for white or against 1d4. Um, but in any event, I think your broader point is a good one. That was sort of my approach when when I signed up, is uh, it's I'm not going to adopt your whole repertoire. I have some openings that I already feel good about, but like, for example... Your, your Ross Alimo course, I'm excited to dig into because that's been giving me trouble. And I don't know what to do against double king pawn. So I'm thinking about the scotch, although I have to admit, I've never, those positions where both sides castle queen side, um, you know, the main the main line, the knight f6 line, I've, I, I always find those positions a little weird because the structure doesn't resemble anything else. And I'm a little hesitant, but I might pull the trigger. We'll see. Yeah, yeah. So that's scotch with uh, scotch with knight f6. Uh, we have that h4 very tricky move, and uh, it's it's comparingly new move. And we have deep analysis. So all our students who uh, play that that variation, they have big practical advantage over opponents because most of the time when they play that h4 tricky move, opponents started to to spend time and think what is this and uh, actually playing from scratch. Uh, we have here a big uh, practical advantage with Scotch, so I absolutely recommend you to watch. About the uh, question of Vishnu, if he want, if he meant that we don't uh, cover a D4 for white, we have one uh, specific uh, reason why we are not covering all the openings. If we cover all the openings, it's not go- it's going to be impossible to stream covering our opening repertoire. And this is a very important part for education that people uh, watch the course and also see it in practice. Again, coming back to the point, uh, we are not going to uh, give chess players what they want. We are giving to uh, give chess players what they really need, but very often they don't know what they really need for improving. Gotcha. Um, yeah, and there's so much content that, as you say, um, at, at the price point, you don't need to use everything. But um, but I want to get to other stuff. There's so much we can talk about. But first, um, let's take a quick break and hear from our friends at Chessable guys this is your weekly reminder to go to chessable.com and see what they've got cooking gm alex kolovich is out with a new course on the chebanenko slav super gm on Ishgiri's lifetime repertoire's french course is earning rave reviews i myself have spent quarantine months finally brushing up on my opening repertoire and of course i make use of chessable's move trainer technology and space repetition to to actually remember the lines and i'm feeling like i'm starting to develop a solid repertoire after years of neglect of course i can't tell you guys what i've been studying that's top secret information and i don't want you prepping for me but just trust me i'm going to be ready so if you want to be 
ready to, go to chessable.com and check out what they have for purchase, as well as their many free, short, and sweet courses that you can check out and learn from. Okay, back to the interview. So, Optic, in my research, I came across a couple good interviews with you, including with Grandmaster Alex Kolovich, who, of course, does some work for Chessable and has been on this podcast. Um, he did a good interview with you where you told some great stories. Um, so, first of all, could could you retell this story of uh, this taxi driver when you were a teenager that kind of um, uh, lit a fire under you? Do you, do you rem- yeah, know yeah, which yeah. one I'm referring to? Yeah, 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 sure. Uh, so, really, that, that was... Uh life life uh, changing episode episode in in my life uh so i was uh, we were coming back with the family uh in the in the in the taxi and my father uh, started to talk with the driver my father was sitting next to the driver the driver was was very sleepy and he was driving very bad uh and my father say you are you seem you seem very very uh sleepy my friend why you don't take a rest and the driver answered, yeah, I, I'm already uh, driving from very early morning, uh, and it, it was already t- 12 a.m., so he was driving uh, more than 15 hours already. And he said, no, I need to go now. After this, I will go to sleep, and then I have another order at 6 a.m. And that was the moment that was life-changing for me, because before that, I was really not really hard worker. I was, ah, okay, chess, let's go to chess school, let's come back, let's do some puzzles, okay, let's go to uh, play with the kids. I was not really hard worker. But that moment I realized that I don't want to have such a life. I don't want to work all my life and uh, most probably that, that man had family and he could not spend time with his wife, with his kids, with his friends. He had just to work. And that moment I realized that oh, uh, I, I need to change, change something and I don't want to become a taxi driver. I want to get something big. And that was the day when from the next, from the next day I started to, to work hard and uh, started to take, into, uh, to take into my hands the shape of my life. I started to become serious about that. And yeah, it, 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 was, it, was, it was a very important day for me. Okay. Yeah. And is it, is it challenging in Armenia? I mean, we know it has the rich chess culture, of course, uh, most famously, um, with, uh, Grandmaster Levan Aronian being from Armenia and friend of the show who's been on the show, Tatev Yabrahamian, who of course has made her way to the United States, um, Melek Kachian as, as well. Um, so it's got so many well-known chess players. And obviously I know just on your team at chess mood, you've got super strong players helping you out and they're always making noise in the pro chess league. Um, but what is the economic opportunity like generally in Armenia? Is is it hard for you to to achieve this goal that was kind of kicked into gear when you were thirteen of uh, not having to to put in um, insane hours for um, not a huge reward? Is it is it tough there? Uh, well, uh, economically, of course, uh, we cannot compare uh, with uh, the USA or. Uh, countries like that and most with most of the European countries um, during all the histories we had war and uh, till now the borders uh, of the Armenia are not in absolutely peace so this uh, because of these main factors yeah economic uh, of Armenia uh, has uh, will, will need time until he becomes uh, like European uh, so um, people people um, especially before people uh, had to really struggle to find a good job. Now it's becoming more easier. Uh, now Armenia you know, had has more startups, more cool companies. And if you are a good specialist, most of the time you will find a good job. Before it was harder. And I believe um, year by year, it's going to be better and better. Th- that's that's good to hear. And in the mean, in the meanwhile, I guess the... The cost of living is probably a little bit lower, so that if you are able to have some success with with a startup like yours, um, it seems like a beautiful country, a nice place to live. Yeah, yeah, co- cost costs are lower. Uh, I was also uh, living in Thailand around one year of my life. It, oh wow! Yeah, when I was coach of their team, I was living there, and it's also a beautiful country uh, with uh, not much uh, costs are are low. Yeah, especially with uh, comparing to the USA. And that is one of the reasons that many people who are working remote, 
uh, they live uh, countries like ours. We have beautiful country. We have nice country. We have nice culture. People are people are nice, and it's easy. It's cheap. It's cheap to live here. Yeah, and of course, I should have also mentioned uh, Tigran Petrosian, legendary Armenian player. Um, so, how big is the chess culture there? Like, how famous is Levaronian? How how famous is Petrosian? How are the how are the young chess players doing these days? Is there a next wave coming? What's what's happening uh, on the ground in Armenian chess? Uh, well. Uh... Around, it was already three years ago, I was uh, the director of one of the biggest chess school of Armenia, and I was surprised how many parents are just dreaming about uh, their kid to become a world champion. Not to take their kid to boxing school, not to take to swimming. It just it if it was for me something like ninety nine people want to their kids to become a chess player. Here, of course, uh, uh, most comes from Tigran Petrosian, our world champion. Uh, many people started to play chess, and the second wave uh, started with, of course, Levon Aronian. Levon Aronian and our national uh, team succeeded that we won Olympiads, world champ- uh, team world championship, and uh, many, many people uh, started to go to the chess. And now the chess schools in Armenia, we have many chess schools, and all the chess schools are full. Uh, mm-hmm. Lots of people are going to chess and uh, want to become grandmasters and world champion. So uh, here we have good place uh, if someone wants to <laughs> grow in chess. Okay, good to hear. But you're not doing as much work with the, the youth program as you were a few years ago? Uh, can, can you say it again? Sorry? Are you still working with the, the youth as you were a few years ago? The, no, no. Uh, when I was the director, because of uh, other political uh, reasons, I leave that, left that school uh, three years ago. And then I went to the Thailand to live there. And then I became their coach. So no, I, okay. I'm now only with my students and uh, with Trasmut. Okay. And you're also spending a bit of time in New York. Is that right? In New York? Yeah. Do you... Are, do you spend time in New York? No, not really. I come. I think your I think your Twitter profile says New York. So, oh, maybe it's one of our Chessmoot team members somehow. Ah, okay. <laughs> no, not not. Okay, Got, glad to get that clarified. And I also wanted to hear a little bit about your decision to retire or something. I mean, I know you're still playing here and there, but like at 23, as you mentioned again on, on Alex Kolovich's blog, which is uh, worth. Everyone checking out if you're not already reading it. He doesn't post that often, but when he does, it's it's always good. Um, you mentioned that at the I mean, or he mentioned at the age of 23, you were rated over 2,600, and you actually decided to sort of step back from the competing aspect of chess. So, what what went into that decision? Uh, well, before I had I had very strong ways to become a grandmaster, which I also shared in that uh, interview. Uh, but when I got 2600, I didn't find a really strong why, uh, why I should push forward. Because I definitely understood uh, that I'm not going to push forward to become a world champion. I understood uh, objectively that I have not that talent uh, to compete with the best of the world. And I also uh, was not going to invest all my time interest as I had other interests. I had many other interests in life, and uh, if I just push a little bit and I become 2650, what's the difference? What? If I push more, okay, I get 2680, what? Even if I get 2700, and, and then what? If I spend 10 hours a day and I am 2700, what, what is the reason? If we speak about financially, <laughs> there is no reason. Yeah. Uh, even if you are in top uh, 50 in the world, uh, you will make much less if you are in top 10,000 lawyers in the world. Uh, the only reason would be make if I was big, big fan of chess and I would enjoy all my 10, uh, 10 hours. Yeah, I was big fan of chess until now all the time when I am seeing chess board. Uh, it's my passion. I love it. But it was not that I was going to spend all my life in chess. This, that, that was something uh, definitely I was understanding. And also, uh, as uh, Tom Sura, uh, it, it says, uh, who, it, who it says of Tom. Okay, uh, a- anyway, there was a very nice sentence. So there are, as we have uh, two important uh, days in our lives the day we came to, our, to the earth and the day we found out why we came. Mm-hmm. And 
always I had some kind of belief in me. Maybe I was wrong, but it was my belief uh, that I have bigger things to do in my life than just to play chess. And I knew that sooner or less I'm going to go to something bigger. And then it was the day I said, no, it's, it's, it's enough already for me. I stopped it, especially I had very bad tournaments uh, when uh, I had bad tournaments because of my opponent's computers were becoming very, very stronger than yeah. I had very bad preparation. So I realized that now if it's already becoming not just uh, who is playing chess better, but whose computer is become is better and many other stuff like that. Uh, I felt annoyed about all this stuff and I stopped uh, playing professional chess, especially I had at uh, that time a little experience uh, with coaching others. And I felt that, oh, coaching, I am uh, enjoying more. And I can be a very good coach because uh, I believe I become grandmaster, um, not because of talent. I was uh, objectively not very talented. My memory, my memory is horrible. My friends hmm. were laughing uh, how I was remembering the variations. I was not remembering any, remembering anything. I could solve a puzzle, and after two days, I could see the same puzzle and solve it again because I forgot that I solved it again already. Uh, I have even uh, I, when I was. On my way to become grandmaster, I was solving lots of uh, composition studies. And then I was saving that studies. People are asking, why do you save it? I said, oh, I will save and after one month I will uh, solve them again. Because anyway, I will not say, I will not uh, remember them. So I didn't, I was not uh, very talented, but I was hard worker. And with this skill, when you are not very talented, super talented to compete with top 100, uh, enough talented to get in top 100, but not enough to, to push forward. Uh, I felt like this is all it's about. Uh, I have all the skills to become a good coach. And so I was enjoying it. So I said, why not? Why not to do Why not to do that? And it's more fun, really, because when you are just uh, playing your chess, uh, it's you and your success who makes you happy or unhappy. But when you have 10 students, one is playing there, one is playing there. You are excited about all of them. Oh, he won this Grandmaster. He made, he made this first GM norm. This is all so much emotions. And uh, this, uh, I feel like these things are making me more happy. And also my philosophy, of course, every one of us has different uh, uh, philosophies. Why we are living mine is uh, people uh, should live for their happiness. And I felt like this is, this is making me happy. So I, I stopped playing professional chess. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, most people would, myself included, would be ha happily retire if we reached your level. But I'm always just generally interested in that moment where you're sort of confronted with, with your mortality in whatever it may be, whether it be like, as a kid, if like, I loved basketball and baseball. And when you're a kid, you think you're going to be a professional, you know, but then someday you realize, wait a minute, these other kids, <laughs> like, I'm just not going to be as good at them. And in chess, whatever level you settle at or settle near, or at least plateau at, there's there's often that realization, like Patrick Wolf, um, Grandmaster, who was recently on the show, told an amazing story of um, uh, working on working on the team with uh, Grandmaster Viswanathan Anand, and just realizing this guy's just on a whole separate level um so obviously i get what you're saying and the opening preparation is a big thing that other other grandmaster guests have highlighted as well as something that either you enjoy it or you don't but but back when you were playing a lot did you ever play someone or analyze with someone where you were just kind of blown away by uh by what they how the way that they approach the game uh, well, one thing happened uh, with me, which also uh, was confusing for me. Uh, I was uh, playing in Corsica. It was I had a very good tournament, uh, and uh, it was open tournament. And then uh, ten people were qualifying to the next round. Uh, four great four four great chess players, including Vishwanathan Anand, are joining you. And with uh, four, fourteen not it's not fourteen sorry sixteen uh, players, you are playing Robin. Uh, who 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 lose he is kicked uh, kicked off, and uh, the first round I was with my friend Malcolm and I won him, and then the second uh, round I need to play with Anand, hmm. and it was fantastic experience. Like to just, that that night I could not sleep because I was sleeping there. And, oh, next day I am against Anand. So, so two games, rapid games. Uh, the first game uh, in a drew position I lost, and in the second game when I needed to win already. I pushed very hard, and one moment I get very big advantage. At the end, uh, he's very skillful. He just easily somehow managed to defend it. And uh, one and a half, half I lost. And I thought, okay, he's good. 
But then what happened? Uh, when we are already outside, uh, the others, uh, other participant went out and Anand started to talk about other positions uh, because the games were uh, showing in the big monitor. And I realized that Anand was not just playing against me, like, okay, with one hand he was playing against me. And he was calculating all other positions because after end of the game, myself, I was only in my game. He talked with everyone about their positions and he was not just asking questions. He was showing, I remember he showed Jones, he said, why you didn't play this? Jones answered him something and Anand said, no, you could do this, 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 this. And Jones says, all oh, right. And I was, what is this? What is this? This is human. How he did all these calculations during uh, during the game with me, and now he calculated all that six other games, and then it was the first time when I was uh, really communicating in chess with a giant, and this is putting okay, man, you are twenty six hundred, he's twenty eight hundred, hello. <laughs> yeah. Wow, it's it's amazing how many of these stories like that seem to uh, um, involve Anand. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, of all the superhumans, he gets he gets mentioned uh, gets mentioned a lot as someone that that just humbles uh, uh, even grandmasters like yourself. It's uh, it's it's funny to hear, but but that's a cool story. Yeah, so that's, um, that's the top top ten. It's totally it's an incredible level. Yeah, I, I can only imagine. Um, and we actually had a question from uh, another Patreon supporter of the podcast, Chris Wainscott, related to your playing. Um, so Chris says. Uh, Avtek, since you're essentially retired as a player, what do you do to stay motivated to work at a high level? Do you still work on improving your chess? If so, what are the differences between how you train now versus how you trained as a professional player? And lastly, any plans to play again in the future? If St. Louis were to invite you again, would you play? Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, really, I didn't play chess uh, three years uh, when the last year I participated in St. Louis and it was uh, incredible uh, feelings. There was even funny things happened in that uh, in that tournament. Uh, shortly, I will tell you. Uh, I didn't play three years, and I went to to play the first round, uh, and I was playing with white. I played knight f3, and then I put my pen to write in the blank my move, and then I forgot which language I was writing the moves. Hmm. Did I write on Armenian, or Russian, or English? I didn't uh, write anything on notation three years. And then I didn't figure it out. I just put on English and F3. And after 10 moves, I realized, okay, uh, in my subconscious mind, I am writing in Russian. So before it means I was writing in Russian, the notation. So I started to write in, in, in Russian. Mm. Uh, yeah, I didn't play a long time. And after I stopped playing uh, professional chess, I still was in chess. Most probably after retiring, and now my knowledge is much, much more than when I was playing professional chess. But uh, when my knowledge is more, uh, comparing when I was playing professional chess, it doesn't make me better chess player. Because uh, knowing chess and playing chess, they are, they are very different stuff. So before, for example, when I was playing professional chess, uh, I was spending lots of time for keeping myself in a good shape. I mean, working on calculation and other uh, stuff. And now most of the time uh, on chess, especially with uh, high level players like grandmasters, they are going for um, opening pre preparation. Now I learned so many uh, different openings because students play different openings and to support them, you need to know all of them. So the theoretical knowledge becomes uh, more, the end game knowledge becomes more and more theoretical and complicated end games I uh, know as uh, then before. And again, this doesn't make me a better chess player. It just make me a uh, man who knows um, chess more, who is better a coach, uh, but not better chess player. Because for playing uh, good chess, yeah, just knowing uh, chess is not enough. There are many uh, 2,600 level players is that if you analyze with them chess, uh, you will be surprised because you will feel like they are around 2,500 levels of what they are playing, but they have very strong uh, playing skills. And there, at the same time, there are 2,600 uh, players with whom you, when you analyze, you feel they are 2,700 or 2,700 plus. But when, when it's coming about playing chess, they have the same 2,600 uh, rating. So uh, knowing chess and playing chess are very, very different things. Yeah, I think a lot of club players feel that way too. Like, uh, you know, there's so many enthusiastic 
chess book readers just read every book under the sun, but but when it comes time to play, they might make the same mistake over and over again. Um, I certainly feel like I fall in that category to some extent. True. Um, for 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 playing good chess, you should have uh, many other skills, like for example, concentration, sharp mind. You should have skill of good time management. You should have skill of making practical decision. Here is a position. In one case, you can take the pawn, and in one case, you can sacrifice the pawn. You think both are equal, but which one is more practical? And many, many or how to uh, survive in lost position. This is a practical skill. And many, many such skills are important for playing a better chess. Yeah, and a lot of that stuff is why game analysis is so important. Um, I, I, I hope and you will solve lots of your issues after you uh, read our, our articles. In our articles, we touch many, many such topics uh, which are not exactly related to chess, but more about psychological stuff, which is important for just knowing chess, but playing chess better. Yeah, I, I would love to. And maybe we could do a follow up in, in a couple of years, although I, I struggle with something that a lot of people are struggling with right now, um, which is you've got all these issues want to address. But here in the US, like we're still basically on lockdown. There's there's very few tournaments. You can't even you can't even try to address them. So I'm finally ready to play some tournaments and like doing that sort of deep self analysis of trying to root out these errors. is It can be part of the fun of being a competitor in chess when you're when you're in that mode, but right now it's it's hard to be in that mode. Um, yeah, I understand. I understand. One of the best solution is to make uh, friendly matches or even friendly tournaments. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I think a lot of people just feel like it's not quite the same. Um, yeah. But okay. I mean, I actually the the few times I was playing training games online, I was I felt like I was doing a good job keep taking them reasonably seriously. But since the stakes don't feel the same to me, it's easier for me to just focus my energy elsewhere. Yeah, agree, agree. With um, yeah, since we all since we all have a finite amount of time. Um, so speaking of books and speaking of your your work ethic, Avtek, um, what were your favorite things to study when you were once you decided when you were thirteen that it was time to stop messing around, and you started putting in really long hours on chess? Wh what did you do to to make it to grandmaster? Uh, well, I can divide my. Uh, progress from 2200 to 2500 this is i remember how i get because 2200 most of the 2200 i got um with just ch going chess school working a few hours with coach and that's it uh, what i started to do after uh, 2200 so i started to work with uh, one of my friends who was at the same time at uh, my uh, strongest competitor uh, zavan andresian who is also grandmaster so we were kids uh, but we started to work together on chess so he was coming at my place and we can we could uh, work all day and then sleep and then from the early morning start to work at the chess again and uh, that time i learned we we both become uh, become uh, much stronger very fast uh, the crucial part, part was that we had uh, opposite styles my style was positional his style was aggressive and uh, very fast, I learned lots of uh, skills from him about attacking positions, and he learned from me, from me positional. Like many positions there was when I, I, he was saying, okay, it's over, it's checkmate. I was looking at the position and why it's checkmate, it's still complicated mm. position. And after few months, I was saying, okay, he is right. Or at the same time, uh, there was position, he was saying it's equal, I was saying, no man, it's just positionally lost. He was saying why, he was saying uh, later. So we very fast learned from each other many things. And this is something I absolutely recommend people to do. And unfortunately, I see very few people do. Especially if they are kids, uh, their strongest uh, competitor can be their best friend. They don't need really to compete uh, with one uh, person. If they want to become grandmaster or even to get in the top in the world, they are they are competing with the world, not with that guy. So that guy yeah. become a uh, become a uh, friend and good sparring partner. And sparring partner is something incredibly very important thing. Uh, then, when I get twenty four hundred, um, I was starting to I started to work with one of my coaches, Arthur Chibukchan, uh, who helped me a lot, especially in uh, better understanding the chess. Uh, then I had books, um, many books like Dvoretsky books. Uh, I was reading all kinds of classics. I was working a lot on my calculations. Uh, one book made lots of difference in my chess. It was 50 memorable games of Gelfand. 
I like to read books uh, when the author and the writer is the same person. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not written uh, about Gelfand's book about by other grandmaster, but Gelfand himself is commenting the games. He's sharing his thoughts why he did that move or not that one. I remember that book made a big uh, impression on me and uh, changed a lot uh, my choice. And then uh, when I got twenty five hundred uh, to twenty five hundred to twenty six, it took me a copian. Most uh, the impact of my growth from twenty five to twenty six, it was he. Uh, Akopian, not Akopian, there are two Akopians. One is Akopian, younger, and one is Akopian Vladimir. So Akopian Vladimir was my coach, and we had days, we had weeks where I was going to the, to there, and from the morning till we were working till we were getting very tired. And I learned so, so much things from him and his experience, uh, how incredibly he was attacking and how easily he was defending a position, which I could think, okay, this is just going to be 50, uh, 50 moves fight for draw. In a few moves, he was doing that draws. And then I learned so, so much things. He was just, uh, sometimes um, he was just winning me and my computer together. There was a hmm. position he was saying, okay, this is lost. There's this attack should be winning. And boom, I'm sacrificing some knight. I was like, what is he doing? Why he sacrificed the knight? I was putting engine. Engine was also showing, what is this? Minus three. But then me and the engine together, we could not fight against that. And he was just checkmating us, both of us. And the same about uh, how to draw uh, bad positions. There were positions that I thought, okay, it's a big advantage. He was saying, oh, no, it's a draw. <laughs> I said, oh, draw. And we were moving, moving pieces. And after five moves, okay, it's really draw. I said, no, 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 Let, let's, let's put five moves back. I try another way. I was trying another way. Again, he was making a draw. Then another, then another. And I was, oh, how he is doing this stuff? How, how he's making a draw is this the position when it looked like so, so, so bad? And then I learned from him how he was slowly, slowly uh, exchanging his bad pieces, how he was getting rid of his weaknesses. He has just, he had that skill, uh, which uh, was very important for me for getting 25 to 2600. I realized how many positions with each, which, which looks like that, okay, they are bad, but it's they are easy draws. And how to make draws when you are in uh, trouble. He had that skill because he was playing on the top level many, many years. And he fought a lot against people like Kasparov or Kramnik. And we can imagine how many bad positions he had in his life. And right. Yeah. <laughs> he had to defend them, otherwise he would not be there. And then uh, with defending against people like Kramnik or Kasparov, he eventually got that skill. And what I took from him was not just how to defend, but I was all the time uh, pressuring uh, uh, against a very tough defender. And then when it was coming in about uh, the game, uh, it was much easier for me to convert uh, winning positions against others because during the lessons I was trying to win against toughest defender. So Akopiana had a uh, huge impact on my I get on my twenty five to twenty six hundred this journey. Okay, that's that's good stuff. So basically, I mean, to, in order to sort of universalize your experience as best we can for people, definitely good to find a, a sparring partner. Um, but also uh, a coach. It sounds like you've had a lot of help along the way, just as you yourself have helped others along the way. Um, and you recommend Gelfand's book, your educational material, of course. Um, and of course, you need to do game analysis to work on the the, the actual competitive skills that we that we've talked about. Yeah. There, yeah. There uh, of course. Uh, so people people who have who come to us and say, for example, they have six hour to, to six hour to spend on chess. What to do? Exactly. Yeah, that's a that's the question we all want to know. Yeah. So one of the things uh, I'm just uh, saying depend, depends depends uh, in what uh, what is their level, of course, and what kind of shape is their opening repertoire, and it's going to divide uh, very interestingly. At first part, especially for example from scratch, they want to learn E4 and learn all our material. Uh, they I, I divide their uh, learning process to some kind of ninety five percent of the time learning five playing. Uh, at first, they know, they learn all this stuff so they can put in uh, put, put in practice. So after they learn, for example, all the opening repertoires, I recommend already to switch to 50-50. And uh, 50 learning and 50 playing and uh, analyzing uh, the games. And I recommend analyzing even Blitz games, but not deeply as you do your classical games, but uh, check out uh, with Engine the Blunder parts 
and the opening part what you did what you, what you did wrong because the opening part if you don't check your game and you don't find that oh in your file or in the course was another move you did something else you would do it that mistake again and again and again and about uh, checking the blunders with engine this is funny part people think that oh uh, blunder is blunder but it's not every uh, chess player has his blunders some people are blundering more bishop moves some people are blundering knight moves some people are blundering some uh, death life uh, tactics ab about topic deflecting some people about other topic and it's very important to fix your blunders not other blunders just yours because uh, blunders have a habit of repeating if you don't see your blunder uh, you don't fix it it will happen again and again so this is a cool way even if you play blitz games even if it's three plus zero five plus three whatever is the time control yeah it's important to at, at the end to uh, check out what you did mistake and it uh, depends of your weakness it's uh, your uh, the other 50 percent of the time um, or 70 depends on what what level you are it should be divided on uh, your uh, most on your weakness but not forgetting about your strengths too for example if you are very good in uh, calculation and you stop to work about calculate and you stop working in calculation uh, you don't do any tactics nothing uh, after a few months you will find yourself it becomes very bad so uh, the skill is uh, to uh, the, the important part is to uh, continue uh, keeping your strength uh, strong part in a good shape but working on your weaknesses for example if you are very good in calculation and tactic uh, you don't do more than uh, 15 15 minutes a day just 15 minutes a day it's already you keep uh, your uh, shape your mind in a shape if your weakness is in end game okay spend more there or in middle game more there if your strength uh, if your weakness is in the openings okay cool spend more time on the openings but not forgetting about your strength and also uh, putting work there too Excellent. Yeah. And listeners, if you didn't hear last week's interview with Grandmaster Daniel Naroditsky, funny enough, he said exactly the same thing about identifying the types of tactical errors, even in blitz games. So it's it's interesting to hear two Grandmasters back to back highlight sort of the exact same point, because I've been playing more blitz than I sometimes do, um, because because of, uh, again, because of the virus. And I, I do play through the my games. I always play through the opening. I always try to learn one new move, at least from like one move deeper from whatever opening I play. But I just kind of, I kind of had all my blunders under the same umbrella. But but you and Danya have inspired me to um to go a little more granular and really figure out what, what the the nature of the blunders is yeah, so, yeah. so exactly ben you especially blitz games you don't need to really go deeper and, uh, and say okay engine says this move i did that one oh how bad i am how bad i am because yeah that's what i do <laughs> it can kill your confidence this is engine yeah player. and this is one of the biggest problem of amateurs working with engine after they play games they are oh what the game i played yeah good <laughs> right. they watch the game with engine and then you say wrong 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 this is wrong so approach but uh, just checking the blunders can be a very important part okay good stuff and last thing Avtik, i know you've you've thank you for for taking so much time um My pleasure. i understand that um that you're, I'm, you've mentioned you want a life away from the chessboard. You have other interests. I know from your interview with Alex Kolovich that you're into Kung Fu. Is that, is that still ongoing? How are your Kung Fu skills? Uh, well, uh, yeah, uh, uh, Kung Fu is, is, uh, is my, one of my passions. Uh, I, I, I like that martial arts, especially the one I uh, was learning, the Wing Chun. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, my main coach uh, left the Armenia and went to live in the USA, and I started oh, man. to practice uh, less. But still, I was practicing uh, Wing Chun. Uh, I was uh, mixing it later with Muay Thai, because when I went to the Thailand, it was big guilty to not learn Muay Thai when you are living in Thailand. And I, I wanted to mix them, because uh, Wing Chun is not really martial art. It's some kind of killing arts. So at first part you defend, but then you don't punch your opponents. You just with your fingers, you enter to your opponent's throat, something very bad thing. So I wanted to learn some Muay Thai. So defend with the Wing Chun, but uh, attack with Muay Thai. Uh, I like it because um, it uh, when you are um, in a good physical shape, you have some discipline in your life. It helps with your mind too. And especially when you are uh, working some kind of, more, most of the time you work on mental stuff, 
uh, you are tired mentally at the end when you go to some gym right now i'm going uh, to around three or four days i'm trying to keep it to swimming this is a very good thing uh, to do uh, but uh, kung fu yeah it's uh, it's contact uh, sport and because of the covid if i go to uh, <laughs> To train uh, kung fu, uh, I, I can I can be arrested, <laughs> right? Unfortunately, not keeping the rules. But yeah, yeah I, 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 uh, kung fu wing chun is yeah my uh, passion and overall I I, I think everyone uh, should spend some time on sport. Yeah, makes sense. So is that something you you impress upon your students as well? Well, you know, uh, you, you will be surprised, but I had students, uh, especially when I was working in Thailand. Uh, whose fathers I told uh, don't bring uh, me don't bring your son to chess and take him to the Muay Thai first. Uh, the reason uh, was many people are coming uh, to chess and playing okay just playing chess but they are not fighter and if you cannot uh, if you are not fighter in your soul you cannot be good in chess. You will very easily give up when your position is a little bit uh, bad. When it's your opponent, then okay, let's let's click, uh, let's resign and click the new game in chess.com. Right. Yeah. So you should be fighter, and uh, when especially you are doing some martial arts, it helps a lot, a lot with chess. I have seen results. I have seen the results of my students who started to do some martial arts, and uh, having success not just in chess, yeah, uh, everywhere you should be fighter if you want to to get something big. You should you should be fighter. Fighter in your soul. I'm not speaking just with your hands or legs. Yeah, fighter in your soul. To not resigner. Always uh, pushing hard. Because uh, if to get really high success was easy, everybody would get there. So it's it's not easy, and you should be uh, you should be tough, uh, and you should be a peaceful warrior. This is one of my favorite movies, by the way. Peaceful warrior, which I oh I read that book a long time ago. It was a book too, I think. Cool one, yeah. yeah book is also a cool one, and I also read the articles of the guy who is still continuing to do uh, peaceful warriors. That, that that should be inside all of us. And uh, yeah, busy physical uh, activity, especially martial arts, help help with this a lot. Yeah, and I know that you've mentioned you before we were recording that you listen to a few Tim Ferriss podcasts. Um, have you uh, heard Josh Waitzkin or read The Art of Learning? He was a yeah, yeah, American yeah. test prodigy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, of came... course. Uh, yeah. Recently, uh, uh, recently, I mean, last two years after I started, I started the trust mode. Uh, despite of being so busy, I was trying to keep uh, to read minimum two books uh, a month. And uh, not uh, not including chess books, uh, right. other books, because uh, I found it such important and such such a pleasure uh, to learn from people who are not theoreticals, but they achieved something in their life themselves, and now they are sharing an experience. No matter what they did, they become an Olympic champion, they become a millionaire, something they already achieved. And I enjoy it, and I'm feeling uh, I missed I, I missed so much when I was young. I didn't re- read these books. Yeah, I know the feeling. Um, cool. And you're you're happily married in Armenia. You're doing your martial arts. Busy, <laughs> busy with uh, chess mood. I'm guessing that doesn't leave much time beyond that. Is there any other major interests that we've left out? Uh, well, uh, the swimming is now part of my day routine. Also. Uh, I have my own uh, psychotherapist because of this all work. It's tough to do without psychotherapists, but it's not a human. It's my bike. Oh, okay. <laughs> my motorbike. Uh, so, uh, well, be careful on that thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I try. I am always with helmet. I know what it can be. Uh, uh-huh. I know that it's dangerous, but it's you know it's very cheap psychotherapist. Because uh, especially on my rest day, I have Mondays. I'm a, I'm on my I'm my rest day. Most of the time with my bike, it's you just drive somewhere and it's taking so much out of you. Uh, so sometimes with my friends, we are going somewhere out of the city. Yeah, this is another activity that I have. I have big uh, love to music. I some some period ago I learned to play on guitar. I want to learn to play on harmonica, but now I have no time, and I understand that. Uh, because you cannot achieve some success, which I want to do with chess mode without sacrificing uh, anything. The same way you cannot achieve grand master or n- nothing you can achieve in your life without sacrifices. So I temporarily sacrificed my music, my love to music, 
uh, my times that we could spend with my beautiful wife watching TVs or going to some parks or going to beautiful places. We even didn't have honeymoon when we married. Wow. Uh, we married and uh, we had just two days rest and uh, we came to work. And by the way, we married on Monday because Monday was our rest day. So we mm. did not uh, <laughs> marry other day. So I made my sacrifices. Uh, I know that it worked. Uh, when I'm seeing uh, people's eyes who are achieving what I want them to achieve, when I'm seeing that I can help people, I can contribute I, uh, in their lives, I can put impact there, uh, this makes everything. And uh, at the same time, I believe that everything is temporary. After a few hours, I believe I will have more time and I can spend uh, more time with people whom I love and uh, do more activities which I love. It's a great attitude. Well, congratulations on what you've achieved with the site so far. And I, you know, it's, um, it'll be interesting to see as it continues to grow. So, so Avtik, um, I think people know, obviously they can go to Chess Mood um, if they wanna check it out, but uh, how else can people uh, reach you? Uh, well, um, they can just um, message me in social media. I'm active there in Facebook or on uh, Twitter. If anyone has any questions, they can put it there. Uh, if it's personal, I mean, if it's uh, chess related, chess related uh, we have chess mode forum uh, where our, uh, with our grandmaster team, we are trying to answer all the questions. It's our obligation to answer all pro members questions, but we try also to answer other questions. So if anyone has any chess related questions, which, which we didn't cover, but he has, he is, he can be free to post in our chess mode forum. Um, yeah, he can also communicate with, with me through chess mode. And at the same time, uh, Ben, thank you uh, for not just inviting me here, but again, uh, thank you for all the value you bring here. Myself and I was reading that uh, great book, uh, Tools of Titans, written by uh, Tim Forrest. I was reading, for example, about Arnold Schwarzenegger through what he uh, he, he he passed or some other uh, successful people. And I was in my heart, I was saying thank you, not just to Arnold Schwarzenegger who, for sharing uh, this, but to Tim Forrest. Because without Tim Forrest, myself, I could never uh, reach Arnold Schwarzenegger. But right. he somehow achieved, he brought all this, he talked with all these great people and he summarized the most takeaways. And now I believe many people uh, cannot just go to any grandmasters and ask something. I'm open. Everyone can uh, talk and we can speak about others, many stuff, but not uh, all grandmasters are like this. But you are somehow uh, bringing all of them together. Uh, and I, I can imagine how much uh, value they are, they, they are sharing. And uh, I really absolutely think uh, that you should also write a book, uh, writing down all the uh, important things that people are sharing because you are uh, doing a great job. Also, one of the guys I would like to mention, which I think uh, he's, if, if someone asked me who would uh, uh, give you a word of uh, contribution in chess who is not Grandmaster, most probably I would uh, say Sagar Shah. Yeah, of course. He is doing yeah. so, so much incredible stuff, bringing so many cool interviews, bring, talking with so many cool people. And now he was just, for me, it was all the time, okay, it's, it definitely should be Shagar, Sagar Shah. And after I uh, learned about you, I watched recently other podcasts and read about you. You are also uh, should stay next to him. And uh, people like you who are uh, pu pushing uh, chess forward, but most of the time, uh, you and Sagar Shah, they are staying uh, behind the stands. They are some top grandmasters who are making the shows. But of course, without you, everything would be slower. So thank you all the contribution you are bringing to the chess world. Uh, thanks so much. That's very kind. And of course, it's an honor to be mentioned with I am Sagar Shah of Chess Space India. I mean, he's he's an inspiration. He and his, he and his wife and Ruta are just doing amazing work. So I really appreciate that. And uh, yeah, thanks again, Avtuk. And, uh, and, and uh, it's Friday evening as we wrap this. So I hope you get to relax a little bit finally. Oh, uh, weekends are my busiest days. <laughs> oh, really? Uh -oh. <laughs> busiest days. Monday is my day off. So big tomorrow from early morning, I have another... Uh, uh, hard working day, but all good. Uh, I, I'm laughing, I'm smiling, all is good.
Okay. Well, well, thanks again, Avtik, and uh, have a good have a good night and good continued success with the site. Same, same to you, uh, Ben, and I wish uh, all the best to our listeners. And one thing I really wish from my heart to find uh, find uh, their happiness. Maybe, by the way, uh, I will share last uh, very short story about happiness. Sure. Uh, I was living in Thailand, and I had one day which changed a lot in my life too. I got a call with one of my friends who was a um, multimillionaire and he said, let's go, uh, let's go to have a beer. I said, hmm, why he called me? Okay, let's go to have a beer. And he had a big problem. He had problem in the business. He was almost, he was legal problems and he was going to lose a few millions. Um, he had big problems and he was, he was very sad and he was very far from being lucky person that day. And the same day, I was invited uh, to uh, one place next to Bangkok, uh, not a big city, some kind of village. It was uh, from a chess amateur, uh, and I had a dinner there. They didn't prepare something extraordinary. There was a very tasty rice and other some chicken. Uh, we had a very modest table, uh, but that uh, person was absolutely happy. Uh, we drank. We drank also. He he had some good whiskey with him. And when we both got drunk, he said, "Man, look, uh, I have here my family. Look at my wife who is taking care of everything. Look at her. Look at her smile. Look at my kid who is playing there. In the morning, we are together with my wife. We are going collecting rice and doing the to doing our work. In the evening, here we are coming. We are singing. We are playing on some uh, instruments. I am so happy person. And I was." thinking about that person and about the multimillionaire. Yeah. That I realized, okay, there are people who want family, but they have money and they are not happy. They are people who want money, they have family, uh, again, uh, they are not happy. And I answered that the happiness is all about to live with the uh, priority, with the value hierarchy of your life. And I wish everyone, all our listeners, uh, to think about their a value hierarchy and uh, push their and get their happiness. For someone, it can be grandmaster. For someone, it can be to become a father of grandmaster. Or for someone, it's to be to support someone to do something, yeah, whatever. I wish everyone to pursue and get uh, their own happiness, not to listen to others. Everyone's happiness is different. My happiness, for example, is having all this stuff. Other one can be else, yeah? So everyone should uh, pursue his happiness. And I wish all our listeners uh, to get their happiness. That is excellent closing advice. Yeah, and unfortunately, unfortunately, sometimes it takes work. Sometimes it's a journey, but encourage people to uh, to keep searching. True. Um, True. Okay. Thanks a lot, Avtek. Thank this you. has been a lot of thanks. fun. Okay. Thank a- thanks. Thanks. Special thanks, as always, to my producer Matthew Passy, and thanks to those who continue to help spread the word about Perpetual Chess. Positive reviews on podcast platforms like Apple Podcasts, glowing comments on YouTube help people discover the show, as does telling a friend or or sharing it on social media. Speaking of which, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm at BennyFischel1 or join the Perpetual Chess Facebook group and continue the conversation about the latest interview. Sometimes the guests even weigh into these discussions. The Perpetual Chess Instagram page is back in action, so lots of ways to stay engaged, as they say. But most of all, of course, I want to thank those who provide financial support to the show, especially right now with all this COVID craziness going on in the world. Most of all, I want to thank Chessable for sponsoring the show and to everyone who kicks in via PayPal or the Perpetual Chess Patreon page. I also just put up a little donate directly link on the Perpetual Chess web page where it says donate but again if you're not in a position to donate i'm happy to have people listening and just enjoying the show so without further ado i'd like to give thanks to the people who help make perpetual chess possible i would like to give thanks to the following people and entities chessable.com quality chess books the capital city chess club the apprentice twitch channel andrew alhaji Andrew Bach, Austin Clough, Benjamin Porteau, Bill Sigler, Kathy Carr, Chad Oliver, The Chess Central's Chess Blog, 
Chris Flanagan, Dan O'Hanlon, Danny Davidson, David Schreiber. I am Dimitri Schneider. I am Eric Rosen. Faraz Sawaf, Gary Foreman, Greg Harst, Greg Natel, Greg Shahadi, Guven Manet, James Kennedy, Jens Green, John Jernigan, John Rockefeller, John Cromarty, John MacArthur, Kelly Palmer, Kevin O'Callaghan, Lucio Casada Silva, the law offices of Stuart Katz, LilaAnalysis.com for cloud-based Lila engine analysis, Michael Can, FM Michael Oblin, Mike Zelazny, Mr. Mike Shahadi, the famous Mr. Dodgy, Peter Zodi, Reuven Fisher, Seattle Chess Club, Stephen Martinez, Thomas Stanix, Thomas Tachenko, Todd Bryant of Strong Chess, Todd Kennedy, Wayne Beam, and I also would like to thank the following. Aaron Waffler, Ace Viega, Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com, Adrian Gutierrez, Alex Pejas, Andy Ryerson, FM Andre Terakov, Dr. Andrew Perry, Anita Deer, Barry Hessian, Better Chess Training, Bill Juniper, Bill Moran, Brad and Andy Rosen, Brett Howard Lynn, Brian Mullis, Chad Hilton, Dr. Charles Snodgrass, Chris Wayne Scott, Christopher Baumgartner, Christopher Shabri, Chris Lott, Christopher Wood, I am Christoph Zalecki, a.k.a. Chess Explain, Coach Jay's Chess Academy, Costa Carras, Courtney Fry, Craig Mallon, Daniel Ginsberg, Daniel Naylor, Dave Saylor, David Bleskachek, David Cramley of Chessable.com, Dalen Shelton, Dirk Decker, Drake Domingue, Dwayne Edmonds, Ed Daly, Ethan Smith, Ian Mason, I am Elect, Donnie, Ariel, Fox Valley Chess Club, Francis Latarte Lavoie, Frank Tortoris, MD, Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Geert Vandervelt, Gerard Barta, Giovanni Russo, Hans Schu, Harris Srinivasan, Jacob Kovac, Jack Perry, James Aspinwall, James Bonastia, James Muir, Jason Willem, J. Deep Chakrabarty, Jeff Anderson, Jeffrey Martello, Yep Hoyland, Jerry Wells, Jim Ratliff, JJ Snod, Dr. John Fallon, John Fernandez, John Fontaine, John Hartman, John Jeffrey, John McMurtry, Jonathan Slater, Jordan Goodwin, Jose Rodriguez, Justin Gardner, Jen Shahadi, Joel Rocky, John Thompson, GM, Josh Friedel, I am Kari Christensen, WGM Katarina Nemsova, Kelly Palmer, Kevin Pryor, I am Kostya Kovutsky, Krishna Gopala Krishnan, Kyle McAvoy, Larry Reifort, Laura Boyovsky, Martin Knudsen, Martin Krug, Matthew Passy, Matthew Tedesco of SeattleChessMeetup.org, Mechanics Institute Chess Club of San Francisco, Michael Allard, Michael Hudson, Miguel Araspide, Mike Clem, Mitchell Fabian, Nate Solon, Neil Bruce, Nigmat Mulajanov, Olaf Mueller Michaels, GM Pascal Charbonneau, Passy Passan, and Paul Bain, Paul Clarkson, Paul Sweeney, Paulo Santana, Peter Lux, Randy Temple, Ricky Grijalva, Richard Hallenbeck, Robert Turner, Roy Yearwood, Ryan Berg, the Say Chess YouTube channel, Scott Doherty, Scott McKinnon, Sebastian Finsterwater, Shane Unger, Stefan Roller, WGM Tatyab Abrahamian, Tim Brennan, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, Tom Edsel, Tomas Komanich, Tony Rotella, Tyrin Price, Vishnu Srikumar, William Brock, William Juniper, William Hogarth, William Peterson, FM Zhao Cheng of Chess1000.com, and last but never least, Zhivko Stoyanov. Thanks for listening, everyone. I will catch you all next week.